ZK Snarks, what's that? Can I eat it? Can I buy it? Who, who do I call up to talk about ZK Snarks? So I started digging into it, and um, I fell down a cryptography rabbit, basically, and kind of became addicted to it because I sort of understood the mathematics from my physics background, uh, but it was a completely new field to me. And the idea that you can form compute on encrypted data, that you can prove statements about something which looks like random garbage, blew my mind. And it, it, it was pretty, pretty quickly became apparent, like, I, I quickly saw that combining this with a distributed, like trustless, decentralized ledger, uh, if you could pull it off with good UX, it would be absolute dynamite because you could have, well, you could you could do the kind of things that we were trying to do. You know, you could have um, having a smart contract with private hidden state is extremely powerful. You can have things like identity solutions. You can then, with identity, you can then um, uh, start to interface DeFi and TradFi. You can start to bring real world assets on chain. You can start to do all sorts of crazy things. Hello and welcome to another episode of Devs Do Something. I'm your host, Sam Flamini, and today's guest is one that many of you have been asking for for a long time. We have on the CEO at Aztec Network, Zach Williamson. So Zach has a really fascinating story in terms of how he got into this space, how Aztec was founded, what he worked on before Aztec, all that is discussed in the episode. But we also go really deep into Aztec, like how it works. Uh, we go deep into Noir, uh, cool things you can do in Noir, cool things that Zach would like to see you devs out there build when it comes to Noir. And we talk through the origin story of Huff. So we asked Zach what it feels like to have uh, created this thing that uh, developed, I guess, a community and life of its own. Uh, you know, it, it's kind of fascinating, right? This is a, a thing that Zach built that he didn't expect to really be used uh, that really has, has found a home with the Huff community. Uh, and it was cool to hear him talk about it, right? Uh, he has some opinions on it. He's super you know, proud of what the Huff community has done. And all of that is stuff we discuss in, I guess, the first third of this episode. So this was an episode that I really enjoyed recording. And I think that you, the listener, will enjoy it as well. Whether you're interested in Huff or uh, Aztec overall, you'll probably get something out of this one. So sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy. As devs, we all love hackathons. They're a great way to boost your skill set, meet other engineers, and add to your portfolio of work. At Superfluid, we've sponsored many hackathons and decided to start putting on a hackathon of our own, the Superfluid Wave Pool. This hackathon is a little bit different though in that it's continuous, it's always open. You can submit any project built on Superfluid at any point throughout the month and have a chance to earn thousands of dollars in prizes depending on how your project stacks up. In just the last couple of months, we've seen dozens of teams build really amazing projects that run the gamut from Superfluid developer tutorials to full-fledged applications uh, to a proof of concept Superfluid StarkNet implementation that we thought was really, really impressive. So we encourage you to check it out today. You can learn more by going to superfluid.finance slash wavepool. That's superfluid.finance slash wavepool. Happy hacking. All right, we are here today with Zach Williamson, uh, a very often requested guest. Uh, so we're we're very happy to have you here, Zach. Hey there, yeah, pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Wonderful. So we'll get into uh, to Huff, right? I think you're even you're surprised at, at how this has grown a bit. Uh, we'll probably start our conversation off with that, and then move into your your current work, Aztec Noir, a lot of zk stuff. But before we do all that, how did you get into this space. Good question. How did I get into here? You know, it's very funny. I, like sometimes I, I do. I think I think a lot of people in Web three have that kind of existential moment, right? Where you're you're in some you've gone to some like weird country in the middle of like so, in in a somewhere you're very unfamiliar with, and then you wake up in like a motel or whatever, and you're like, how did my life get to this? You know, like I'm like, uh, what's what on earth is going on? Um, so, but yeah, it's been pretty surreal. I originally started out as a as kind of a failed particle physicist. Uh, I had dreams of being an academic, uh, you know, like being one of those people that like sketches equations on chalkboards and doesn't have to worry about the real the real world or real life. Uh, that was my um, that was my aspirations uh, when I was younger. But then I realized that I had some rather uh, my my vision of 
what it meant to be an academic did not quite match up with reality. Uh, so I had a mild existential crisis and decided to segue into software engineering because I enjoy programming. I'm like, I need a job. You know, there's not, not a great demand in the world for neutrino scientists. So I had to figure out what to do with my life. Uh, and then from that, I fell into startups basically because, um, uh, yeah, a friend of mine was starting this, this startup with this thing called blockchain looking for a technical co-founder. And I'm like, blockchain, you mean like the, the, the scam coins, like Mt. Gox? Um, <laughs> that was my, that was my introduction. But, uh, you know, I was at a loose end in my life. I figured, yeah, startup sounds like fun. Got nothing better to do with my life. Um, just and started diving into the world of Ethereum Web3, distributed ledgers, decentralization, and kind of got pilled on it because um, I think, I think uh, back in, so I got started in 2017 where you have to, like, the, the reputation of, of Web3 was not good. It's still not good, but it was really not good back in 2017. Uh, and so um, uh, I had some, I had some, uh, um, warped perceptions of what um, of the of the of the industry that I, that that were quickly dispelled once I actually, once I actually started reading about the technology, and eventually that I ended up through that startup segueing into into privacy tech because we needed privacy and um, no one was really working on it at the time on Ethereum. I love it. Yeah, I think we that, that's a good analogy. Uh, it, it is like waking up in a motel and wondering how the hell you you got here. I guess. Um, so that those early couple of projects and things you worked on what, what were some of the early couple of things you explored like what what was the initial startup like like we'd love to hear the kind of like the, the prehistory before before aztec and privacy tech yeah yeah so so the original startup was called credit mint because uh we were trying to do a synthesis of DeFi and tradfi and we were you know minting credit on a blockchain a hey, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um but um it was uh yeah basically um my co-founder at the time tom um worked um had like he was a mathematician but he spent he was spending his time working in the in the city of london as a uh, like doing doing investment banking that kind of thing and noticed that there was a like a big opportunity to disrupt a lot of the, a lot of tradfi shops particularly in this this niche semi niche area called corporate debt um when like companies or private equity funds or wanted raise between like 50 and 40 billion dollars so you know like couch change uh, <laughs> um and um it's all industry that that grew up to services um and it's 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 a very interesting it's, um sector where you have a lot of these sp sp boutique um uh, shops like private debt firms where their whole goal is to, is to service this mid-market corporate debt market but their funds are generally there they're a few billion in size so they don't really have the clout individually to to, to construct an, an, a loan by themselves because because it's be way too risky. Uh, so they need to cooperate with one another um, to create deals, but they're also fierce competitors who are trying to sabotage each other for, for deal flow. So you have this very interesting scenario where you have a lot of people who don't trust each other and would gladly stab each other in the back if they could, who kind of need to cooperate to survive, uh, which, you know, if only there was some kind of, trustless technology that they could use to coordinate without having to rely on intermediaries so that was um that was the plan uh, and so a very commercial um uh, idea but i was excited by it because it looked it felt practical as in it felt like a real real use case of blockchain other than you know like shit coins and and and, and meme coins uh, that could have an effect so i was like yeah i'm down with this uh but then we kind of got to the point where we're like oh we need really strong privacy guarantees for this to work. And, you know, transparent blockchains aren't the best privacy guarantees. So what to do? Interesting. So that was your segue then into exploring privacy tech. Mm -hmm. And you went from like the, the commercial side into, you know, back into like writing, writing papers, you know, you went into Planck's, ZK stuff, very, very like dense technical stuff. Um, so what, what, what was like the prehistory of Aztec itself? Like, when did you start working on some of like the early ideas here, uh, and like how did how did Aztec get get started? Yeah, so it's so it really got started in the the winter of twenty seventeen is the, the the origins of it when we were we do you know we had quite a bit was kind of getting started we were getting our initial initial team together we had like a nice family team of four people and we had this kind of privacy issue that we would need to solve 
And at the time, we were quite naive um, because we were like, oh, you can't you just, you know, like just uh, let's just fra- if you just fragment your 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 transactions into 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 tiny little, you know, throw out your tokens into small small addresses and then just like mix them around a bit, then surely it'll be fine, right? You'll get privacy that way. Um, which, yeah, as I said back then, we were quite naive. You can't do that. It's uh, it's, it's pretty trivial to to reverse engineer that kind of stuff. Uh, and so this was kind of an existential threat to the startup. If we couldn't provide strong privacy guarantees, then people won't get to use this because uh, um, it's a massive competitive disadvantage if your competitors, uh, your completely amoral, ruthless, backstabbing competitors can see your entire order book. It's, mm, it's not good. So um, I didn't want to go back to my old job. I was like, I was loving the, the, the startup life, you know, like having a meaningful like, agency over one's work, Doing something at the cutting edge of a new technology, it was I was addicted to. It. I'm like, there's no way I'm going back to my to my old programming job. So, gotta make this work. Mm, Zcash is private. Uh, so, how hard can it be to port Zcash to Ethereum? Let's look into it. Zk Snarks, what's that? Can I eat it? Can I buy it? Who, who do I call up to talk about Zk Snarks? So, I started digging into it, and um, I fell down a cryptography rabbit hole, basically, and kind of became addicted to it because I sort of understood the mathematics from my physics background, uh, but it was a completely new field to me. And the idea that you can perform compute on encrypted data that you can prove statements about something which looks like random garbage blew my mind and it, it, it was pretty pretty quickly became apparent like, like i quickly saw that you know combining this with a distributed like trustless decentralized ledger uh if you could pull it off with good ux it would be absolute dynamite because you could have well you could you could do the kind of things that we were trying to do you know you could have um having a smart contract with private hidden state it's extremely powerful. You can have things like identity solutions. You can then, with identity, you can then um, uh, start to interface DeFi and TradFi. You can start to bring real world assets on chain. You can start to do all sorts of crazy things uh, and create kind of like these these hybrid protocols that's you know basically fulfilling the original Web three thesis of, of undercutting banks. Anyway, so that was that was why I got pilled by ZK basically, and so I was learning as much as I could about it, which back in 2017, 2018 was not. Easy. <laughs> it still isn't easy, but back then it really wasn't easy. Uh, there wasn't really a lot of decent blog articles, learning resources. Um, my my experience with ZK was basically uh, the Cryptography Stack Exchange website and reading academic papers, uh, which was a bit of a grind um, coming coming into it for, as for, as a novice. Uh, it took a lot of effort to acquire a very, very little bit of knowledge, but. Uh, Eventually, um, with a lot of help, I met some amazing people, had some wonderful mentors in this space. With a lot of help, I managed to cobble together a basic privacy-preserving um, cryptography protocol. Uh, by modern standards, it's very primitive, uh, like by today's standards. But at the time, it kind of was a bit of a lifeline because it meant that we could actually continue building credit limits. Um, uh, so that's when we started like drifting into privacy because once we... So this was the original Aztec protocol. Um, it's actually some. It's, a, it's actually the name of a paper. Uh, and once once that technology was refined a bit, we started realizing actually, you know, being a privacy provider, like providing privacy infrastructure for this industry, is going to be a lot more meaningful and possibly hopefully lucrative than than just than building one application on top of the stack ourselves. So. Once we like kind of refine the technology a little bit, um, we got some investment, had the ability to grow. We we're like, mm, I think it became pretty clear we needed to pivot, and so then we became Aztec. I love it. Yeah, that's a fascinating story where you had to build something for your survival, and then realize that the thing that you built was the thing that you should actually be focusing on. So I like that. It's yeah. it's funny how many stories uh, from early stage startups have a, a similar track, um, and uh, I think that's definitely something you guys had to do as well. But Taking a bit of a pivot, okay, so let's talk about like some of the early things you built while working on Aztec. It's my understanding that, that one of the things that popped up throughout this process was Huff. Uh, what I would love to understand, and we're going we're gonna to talk about Huff for probably the next 10 minutes at least, and then we'll get back into Aztec, we'll, oh, yeah. we'll, we'll go into how Aztec works and things like that for developers. But like, wh- what is the backstory behind Huff? Why did you build it? Um, and you know, maybe, maybe answer that question first and then I'll, I'll ask some follow-ups. Why, why did I build Huff? Yes. It's a very good question. Um, uh, so I originally built it as a bit of a joke. Um, so way back in the, you know, in the, in the distant past 2018, you know, when the world was in black and white, uh, the, um, 
doing elliptic curve cryptography on Ethereum was very expensive uh, because um, so the Ethereum network has precompiles like you know built in support for performing arithmetic on specific elliptic curves. But back in the day, they were very expensive. The, like calling this precompiles cost forty thousand gas. Um, and uh, we needed to call. Uh, we needed to call these reading files about fourteen times to construct a proof for the Aztec protocol. So cryptography. Uh, basically, these pre files were expensive and really expensive. And there was a kind of like a movement to try it. There was an EIP to reduce their costs, but it wasn't getting anywhere. And um, uh, there was get, we're getting some pushback from the Core Devs team because uh, like uh, there's there's lots of nuances around like um, how to price these things. So I kind of thought I basically got nervous time because I was thinking to myself, hmm. I bet you could write an EVM program that's fun, that's cheaper than these precompiles, uh, and I, I think I think it'll be this. This was a fun like hobby for me. Um, I got a bit nice night by it. I felt like I justified it to myself because I was thinking, well, I can get this EIP to reduce the gas costs down on these precompiles if I can show that you can do it. You can do you can write a goddamn EVM program that's faster than your like bare metal algorithm. That's um, that's 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 a bit silly. Uh, but I knew that if I wanted to write this crazy, like elliptic curve, multi-skin multiplication algorithm, then I needed uh, um, to basically write an EVM assembly. Um, I, the, uh, at the time, I was quite like frustrated with some of the. I mean, Solidity is a pretty pretty well designed language, and I think the Solidity devs do an amazing job. So I'm not throwing shade on them, but I but I think it's quite clear that um, when it comes to developing the language, the the language devs care very much more about safety versus performance. Um, as in, like, maybe not the structure of the language, right? Like, there's a lot of, it, can, it gets a lot, of, a lot of flack because it's not a very secure language to write in. But given the semantics of the language, given given what you could do with it, like, the the the, 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 the Solidity devs um, aren't going to, like, do, like, crazy wild risky gas optimizations if it risks making the language insecure. Uh, so you need to, if you want to do low-level stuff, you need to write an assembly. That wasn't really a good way of doing it back then. So I'm like, hmm, I'll just make my own assembler. Why not? Uh, how hard can it be? Uh, so I, I threw together this awful thing in JavaScript. Um, that was it was just a hobby. It was just a toy for my for my own use. I wasn't I didn't think anyone else would have any use for it because it was so ridiculously low level. Uh, it didn't it doesn't have variables. It's 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 barely a language. It's not really even really a language. Uh, but if you really want to like squeeze out every single like gas optimization you can, it's it's a great tool. Um, so I managed to build this. This, uh, this program called Via Strudel uh, in Huff. Um, it was cheaper than the precompiles, and it was kind of used as a. Um, it, it became part of the narrative for, for, for why to why to reprice the um, the precompiles, which went through uh, about a week after I wrote Via Strudel, and then that meant that my EVM program was completely obsolete and useless. Uh, and so that was about late 2018. And I basically just abandoned the project on GitHub. I'm like, okay, job done. Um, you know, this is basically the closest thing a software engineer can get to clinical brain damage, and 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 I'm done with this. <laughs> I'm going to move on with my life. <laughs> uh, that's actually pretty funny. Um, so I had somebody that 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 was a past guest. Um, his name is Vex on on Twitter. He works at, at mm. OP Labs. He actually asked if if I could kind of as an extension of what I to what you just said there. Um, can you expand on some of the details with the optimizations you made in, in wire strudel? Um, he specifically mentioned like Shamir's trick, GOV technique, et cetera. Um, yeah, basically it's got, it's so, um, as part of kind of, um, building cryptography software as, as when, and rolling my own crypto, um, uh, I had to become quite necessarily fluent in, in, uh, elliptic curve algorithms and how to make them fast because uh, it's really important for the stuff we do. Uh, so yeah, it's basically got all the tricks. Um, so Shamir's trick, what is Shamir's trick? Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically, um, uh, it's, 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 it's a way of, uh, so if you've got to do like lots of elliptic curve scalar multiplication, so like elliptic curve, if you don't like for, for, for folks listening, um, like what's elliptic curve? Yeah, um, you can treat it as a black box. It's basically it's a mathematical construction, a mathematical object which you could, which sort of sort of looks like an integer if you squint a bit and and, and don't look at it too hard. Um, you can add point elliptic curve points together. You can subtract them, and by repeatedly adding them, you can multiply like a elliptic curve point by a, by a number. Uh, but you can't divide. As in, if I give you if I have elliptic curve point and I multiply it by x, if x is large, then and I give you that point, 
you can't figure out what X is. It's, it's why they're useful for cryptography because you can get one-way functions with them. Uh, um, uh, and so basically this, this, this scalar multiplication algorithm is very, very important. And uh, so there are a few tricks you can do to speed it up because the act of adding electric curve points together is literally requires a lot of math. Uh, and so um, if you want to add, if you want to do multi-scalar multiplication, so you want to like multiply lots of points by lots of numbers and then add the, add the results together, you can do that a lot faster than individual multiplications. That's what Shamir's trick does. Uh, the, the GLV endomorphism is basically, um, it's uh, if you, um, so because all this arithmetic happens in a prime field, uh, elliptic curves are defined in a prime fields. And if you, there are some weird degenerate tricks you can do if, if your field happens to have a cube root of unity, which it does for this BN254 curve, um, and, uh, yeah, like you, if you, if you want to multiply a curve points by a number, it actually is not use. It's actually not that efficient to represent your, that number as an integer. You want to represent it in a windowed non-adjacent form value, which basically <laughs> means you want to represent it in slices of bits, but instead of the bits representing an integer, it represents odd numbers and their negatives. So instead of like zero, one, two, three, four, it's minus 15, minus 13, minus 11, you know, one, three, 11, 15, et cetera, that kind of thing. Um, so there's also degenerate little hacks you can do there uh, to make it fast. And that was why I struggled. Basically, I threw the kitchen sink at the problem. Um, and, and it's got pretty much every trick trick that I that I knew of at the time. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, the optimizer culture loves hearing those kinds of little tidbits and stories. So I appreciate you sharing that. And then um, like, I, like last question, like on, on Huff, like the language design itself, like where did the inspiration for it come from? I mean, it, it, it's, it feels pretty minimal. But it, it like some of the syntax feels like C directives. Um, like, <laughs> like I'm curious. Like, what, yeah. Where did it come? From? So it, yeah, it was somewhat inspired by C and C plus um, plus, but not not in a good way. Uh, basically, I was thinking this thing is really low level and primitive and a bit degenerate. So I'm going to just borrow some syntax from the lowest level degenerate language that I know of. Basically, uh, so so it uses some it uses like a it steals some of the like templating syntax in C++. So you can basically, so you can, you can write a macro out of, um, uh, assemb like you can write assembly code, like EVM code, um, and then dump that into a macro and then compose macros out of macros so that you don't need to like copy and paste and duplicate code everywhere. Um, and then you can also pass in like template parameters of these macros. So you can have a macro, but you like, you literally like doing some, like some find and replace or some text in the macro. It's very, very low level. Uh, and I thought, yeah, the only kind of language I know where you can do this kind of stupid stuff is C plus C plus plus. So I'm like, yeah, that, that, let's use that as this as the basic syntax. Interesting. Yeah. So I mean, it's kind of funny because the way you look back at this story is like, all right, you know, I I did this really complicated thing to solve this problem I had, and in your own words, you got you know as close as you can to brain damage that a software engineer can get, right? <laughs> but what's hilarious is that this has become yeah. this has become like a like a pretty rabid community. I mean, it's still small. It's a subculture, right? Yeah. But uh, people that are into Huff love Huff. They find it addicting. They find it to be one of the best educational tools they've found for understanding low-level EVM. Uh, and, and they love it. Like, they really appreciate the work you did on it. So, I mean, like, hmm. sitting in your shoes, like, why do you think that that, that happened? Like, like, why do you think that it took off and became a community? Uh, have you thought about that at all? It's a very good question I have, because certainly I'm not going to claim any kind of foresight. I didn't think at the time, oh, this is going to be big. Um, <laughs> I thought this is going to be a joke uh, and pe people will people will find it amusing. I don't think we will use it. I mean, like people, I gather people are writing, writing some stuff in production with Huff, actually, with some teams. Um, but so, but why, why did it ever come like big? Uh, in, in, in with, with very much uh, giant air quotes there. It's not that big, but it's um, uh, it's a thing that people use and talk about. And uh, I think there's, I mean, it's part of it is just the like the people who develop who developed half and built into a language. Like they got they created a great subculture with, with pretty awesome vibes. Uh, but I think it's basically um, it serves a need a niche, uh, which is that if you want to write really low level code, really optimized code um, on the uh, on Ethereum. There isn't really much of a better way of doing it than Huff. Uh, you can't really do it in solidity. Um, you used to kind of be able to. The, the, the inline assembly syntax it used to be very, very low level, but they inc steadily and incrementally like, removed the, the, the degenerate low level features because um, they don't want people shooting themselves in the foot with it. Uh, and so 
Huff is basically a refuge for, for like for the for the, uh, for the for the for the for the masochists who are like, I want my foot guns. Like, give me give me give me every weapon you have. You know, I don't care about if it doesn't have a safety. I just want to like, I just want to like use use every tool to its massive to its to its greatest extent. Um, and I guess part of part of okay, I think part of it, part of the reason why Huff has become somewhat popular is because um, part of it, yeah, as you, as you say, it is a learning resource. Something I did not really fully appreciate is that the the interest people have in learning a at the low level, how the EVM works. And I think it's very much a difference between a Generation Z thing and a millennial thing. Because a, quite a lot of the, the Huff crowd are Gen Z. Uh, and I'm not, I'm in a millennial. Uh, when it comes, you know, with, by the standards of this industry, I'm an old fart. And so writing low level code in, in primitive um, environments is not something I that's like novel to me. You know, I grew up with a, my first computer was a 33 megahertz Macintosh with a floppy drive and a dial up modem. Um, you know, I, like I've, I've, uh, you know, I, I cut my teeth right, like writing embedded software for like 16-bit microcontrollers. So the it's not. So I think, and I think, like older software engineers, they don't find any not much novelty in like super low-level programming because it's, 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 it's like not cool. It's kind of it's more like just, um, like uh, an unpleasant uh, memory from that past. They rather rather get rid of. Um, but for folks that, um, I would say like for. for for Gen Z folks, um, like the abstraction la- levels, layers that they've grown up with when it comes to interface with technology are so much more high level uh, than previous generations, where, um, you know, we, where it's very hard to get access to the bare metal of devices. And, uh, and so I think perhaps the, the puff scratches an itch, really, which is to, to, to understand how low level machines work, even if it's just a virtual machine. Um, and how like these high level programs that people were actually turned into machine code that then get executed. It's, um, and yeah, it's a fun learning exercise, particularly because the EVM is a relatively simple virtual machine. It's certainly, it's a lot easier to understand than something like, um, like the LLVM. So yeah, I think basically why do people write half? Because, it, because it makes them feel like part of the, part of a web three nerd elite, uh, that gives them magic powers that other folks don't have, um, the ability to write very, very optimized code. Yeah, that's a great way to to summarize it with that last line. Part of the Web3 Nerd Elite. Yeah, you guys, you, you Huffers are the Web3 Nerd Elite, so you should feel good about that. Uh, and last question on Huff, like, where do you want to see the community go if, if you know, if, if you have any input at all? You might just be like, hey, this is cool to watch. I'm just going to sit back and let you guys do your thing. But like, is there anything that you'd be curious to see the Huff community explore any directions you, you think it'd be interesting for them to, for them to take any insight there? Yeah, interesting question, because I think, um, like the, I don't think I have a, any particular like grand plans as in, uh, as in, you know, it's just, it's just a pleasure to see this, this community grow and grow and, and evolve and develop, you know, this is basically, Back in 2019, I thought that this this is basically my, like in my mental model was this this software is basically just old old garbage that I've that I left out on GitHub and then I came back a, a couple of years later and like then and a bunch of bunch of like 16 year olds have taken hold of it and are building cool stuff and I'm like whoa <laughs> um, so but in terms of where where for it to go um, you know I think it's it. I think it's got it's, it's got its niche as a very fun educational tool um, for to understand the EVM, and I think it's it's going to also find its role as um, a language, a, tool, a basic tool that people use if they really really need to extract maximum games gas savings. I think you're starting to also notice as folks become more familiar with smart contract programming, the complexity of algorithms that people are willing to implement to deploy to production are increasing steadily. Uh, um, like gas costs notwithstanding, but you know, uh, ZKVMs and optimistic uh, rollups sort of solve that. And so I can I can envision a future where, uh, like, there's a there's a lot of value right flowing through Ethereum, like far more than there is now, where it's, it's actually becoming like a relatively important financial infrastructure. And gas costs matter more than they do now. And there's going to be some interesting pressures to um, to optimize code and to and to and to, and to like squeeze as much gas savings as you can out of your contracts because ultimately gas is money. And so there is there is a there is a, a weird timeline. I'm not sure it's a good timeline. I'm not sure it's a bad timeline, but it's a very weird timeline where basically half becomes 
like a somewhat semi mainstream programming language, a bit like Fortran or Cobol, where like you, it's 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 basically like the <laughs> language. Okay, this would be hilarious, um, and I would love to see this just because it was it's just completely degenerate and like the the weirdest timeline. But basically, if if Fuff becomes the language for business applications on Ethereum, uh, like 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 basically where there's lots of money at stake and every single gas matters, and so you don't want to lose any gas through having some high level abstraction programming language. This will be hilarious if. Uh, like completely degenerate. If Huff becomes the language of business, the business language um, on 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 blockchain on, on Ethereum, it's the language that you go to when there's lots and lots of money at stake and every single gas like that you're spending counts because uh, because you know ultimately you're spending money that you don't have to. Uh, there is there is there is there is a there is a, there is a, a slight chance that that happens uh, and that would be a fun world to live in. I think. Yeah, that'd be a great timeline. That'd be a great timeline. Uh, so yeah, all your all your time invested in Huff, guys, all the optimizations, it's going to be worth <laughs> it one day. Um, but okay, all right, switching to your work today, um, I want to dive into Aztec and Noir. Uh, before we do that, though, most of our listeners, I mean, it, there's there are people from various ecosystems, but most of our listeners come from like an EVM background. Like, they're people that write Huff. They're people that are just like, you know, mid-level beginner Solidity developer types. And I mean, they're very curious about like building on Aztec and ZK Tech in general. Um, as someone who who did this, right, who, who went, you know, back in 2017, who, who went down this rabbit hole from like building stuff on Ethereum to like learning how ZK works, diving through the, the, the cryptography stack exchange. What kind of like mental models and things do they really need to understand and become comfortable with before they can really be effective with things like writing noir code uh, or just building any any kind of like actual privacy focused zk blockchain? Like, what what initial things would you would you throw out there? Interesting. Yeah, I guess. Can I can I be slightly cheeky and give you two answers to that question? Because I th I think there's there's the answer of what you need to do today, and there's the answer of like what you'll need to do if we uh, are successful as Aztec and, and generally if there's the, the the community because there's also fix of building some of the things. If the community is successful in our endeavors, because if you go back to 2017, what do you like, if you want to you want to build zk apps on blockchain? What do you need to do? You need to be a cryptographer. Um, you need to like have a deep fluency in cryptography cryptographic protocols. Ideally, publish your own. And you need to run your own crypto, <laughs> so kind of a high bar. Uh, and so, one of one of my goals has been over the like one of the, one of the main goals of Aztec is to reduce the barriers to entry and to massively increase accessibility of zero knowledge technology um, to the point where you don't need to be a cryptographer you, and you you can like you, where it's accessible to software engineers where the heuristics that you need to have in your head to to program Z in ZK are intuitive to engineers, and um, uh, you don't have to like understand the nitty gritty of cryptography. You don't need to know like about like Merkle tree non inclusion proofs or security parameters or, or weird things like that. Uh, we're not fully there yet, but we're making some great progress. And I do think that this this, this overall architecture building Aztec three is going to um, finally bridge that divide. Um, but in the um, and Noir is very much an evolutionary step towards that. Uh, so NOR is a programming language that exposes like a, a, a Rust-like um, um, environment uh, that compiles down to um, zero-knowledge uh, circuits. So the idea is you can write your program in NOR uh, and you can compile it it'll, and you can deploy it uh, as, a, as a verification smart contract to Ethereum and you can then generate proofs um, and send them, to, send them to your smart contract, uh, very much like uh, Circle and Socrates. Um, but uh, the the goals for Noir are basically to provide, to try and do for ZK what LLVM did for um, compilers in uh, for, for you know, regular computers. Because uh, because generally the way that most ZK languages work is that they'll directly compile to circuits. Um, and uh, that's a little bit restrictive because it makes it very hard to update your proving systems in your cryptography because like in this space, you know, crypto cryptography protocols are obsolete every six months or so. Uh, space is moving very rapidly, uh, and it also limits uh, limits the um, the use case, right? If you're locked into a specific technology provider's cryptography, 
And so what we're trying to do with Noir is very much, um, so Noir is a language front end for ZK. So the idea is that when you, if you write your Noir program, the Noir compiler is not going to compile down to like an Aztec um, plonk circuit. Uh, what it's going to do instead is it's going to compile to, to uh, an intermediate representation. So we call it a say, abstract circuit intermediate representation, which is basically it's a sequence of opcodes, a bit like LLVM intermediate representation. But for SNARKs, uh, so the idea is that the opcodes are like SNARK friendly. They're designed so that they're easy, easy to compose inside SNARK circuits. And then um, that uh, that that IR that ASEA is taken is is then passed on to a cryptography backend, you know, which acts a bit like an LLVM compiler, which will then compile that ASEA down to a down to a specific proving system and a specific constraint system. So, for example, we have a uh, we have an Aztec backend or not, obviously, because you know we we, we wrote it. Um, but uh, we also have things like the NARC backend. We're building an ArcWix backend. We're looking we're looking at getting a Halo two backend. So, like all of the various cryptography software stacks that exist out there. Um, so that basically the idea is that people can adopt and ad adapt Noir for their own use cases without um, without being like locked into a specific uh, like tech ecosystem. If that makes any sense. Yeah, that's interesting. So, are you are you saying that like the could that IR target other ecosystems if somebody else were to build like different backends, like beyond just Aztec? And yeah, that's the goal. Oh, interesting. That's that's absolutely the goal. That's really cool. Thanks. Um, like, we see it as very much a positive sum game, as in, um, you know, if we make Noir a very open architecture, then if other people use it, then well, that grows the stable of Noir developers, which will then you know um, it means that there'll be more people working on Noir and fixing problems for us and uh, like growing the growing the stable of Noir users, and as as we want to use Noir to, as the as a base for the like Aztec 3's contract language, uh, the more Noir developers out there, the, the, the better for us. So I think it's a very it's kind of a win win scenario for everybody uh, by making it open. I love it. Okay, so all right, so I'm sure this is probably somewhere in your docs, but like let's just do this here for listeners. Yeah. What's like the the hello world program for for Noir? Like, let's say I'm a Solidity dev. I know what I'm doing in Solidity. I want to build just like a simple Noir program. Like, can you walk us through like what what it would look like to start with something very simple? Yeah, so something very simple would be basically something like a um, like a secret checker. Um, so basically, imagine you you put a you, you upload a hash onto a smart contract, and um, so it's like a sealed bid auction or something. And actually, let's take sealed auctions because. Uh, uh, I'm not sure it's I'm not sure it's in our docs, but it's it's a call for Hello World. Um, so, uh, you know how how you normally do it on Ethereum is you um, you you create your bid as a hash. So you take a secret, you take your bid, you hash them together, boom, you, you put that on chain, and then after the bidding period is over, you then come up, turn up, and you um, provide the secret and the and the bid um, to a smart contract. It'll then unpack your hash and go, okay, yep, yep, you're a bidder. This is what you bid. Uh, how about instead of you instead of that you serve as an auth proof saying I'm not going to tell you what I, who I am, but I can tell you that this is my I own this <laughs> I own this hash and and I can tell you what the bid is. Uh, so basically, it comes it comes becomes identity um, uh, hiding and, and, and anonymous. So you can create an, like an anonymous auction network, and that's a very simple Noir application because it's basically you're just proving you know the pre, the pre image to a hash function. Um, so basically, it's the same as the Solidity program. You have a secret, you have a bidding value. It's just that the, the secret is a private input to your snark circuit, um, not a public one. That's fascinating. Yeah, that that's a that is a cool that is a cool hello world. That's actually a little cooler than like a a token contract ERC twenty. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, I like that a lot. Um, yeah. uh, what about this is like another I guess separate feature. Um, but what about private functions and private contracts? Like what what makes these possible? Like mm. I mean, it makes sense being a privacy preserving like environment on Aztec, but like, how did, does that actually work under the hood? Yeah, so it's it's it requires a lot of like degenerate voodoo cryptography. Um, it's basically the thing we've been trying to do kind of since 2018, but we've never had the tech uh, to pull it off until now. We've literally had to like invent some of it ourselves. It's it's, it's such a it's, it's a hard problem, but. but uh, Okay, so how do you do it? Right. So let's say you have a, a smart contract. Um, but let's say now it's, it's not written in Solidity, it's written in Noir. And you have you, your contracts composed of public functions and private functions. The public functions operate on like public account-based state, like Ethereum. You know, you have like mappings and ints and the regular stuff. But the private functions work on private states. So state is now owned by individuals. 
um, it's encrypted with their keys and only they can uh, like mod like they need to provide uh, like um, uh, like only they uh, only people who know the secrets to that to that state variable can actually modify it. Um, so how does that work? Well, the idea is that each function in your contract is going to turn into a Zeki snock uh, circuit and a Zeki snock verification key, and your the, your contract is defined as the sum of your public and private functions. Uh, uh, not the sum of the set. So let's to so give an example. Let's say let's say you want to execute some private functions. How does that work? So we have a a, a concept, um, a kind of a critical circuit uh, in Aztec three called the kernel circuit. So this nomenclature is borrowed from a paper from twenty fifteen called Zexi. So what a kernel circuit does is basically it acts like a miniature node where it's it's verifying the correct execution of one private function call, and it's doing that as in a snark circuit because the idea is is if you as a user, if you're going to send a transaction to the network, you need to construct these like proofs of private function calls yourself locally so that you can hide all the information. So what's going to happen, right? Okay, so transaction sender. Um, you're going to inside your kernel circuit. The kernel circuit is going to, going to require a few things from you. First of all, it has a function call stack. So a list of all the fu private functions that, you need, that need to be executed. Um, so I, you know, when, you, when you start out, it's going to start with one entry in the function call stack. Uh, and what the kernel circuit is going to do is it's going to pop that function call off the call stack, and then it's going to verify it. And by that, I mean that you're going to have to provide a proof of knowledge that proves that you've um, constructed the function proof correctly. You're going to have to prove that the verification key for that function it exists in a in a in a like a Merkle tree um, database, um, like the, the layer two like, contract database. Uh, um, so you're going to have to like say, okay, here's there's a contract address. It points to a location in a Merkle tree where you have a bunch of verification keys, and like um, there's there's a specific verification key. With a specific function signature, I'm calling it. Here's a proof of correctness. Um, and then what the kernel circuit's going to do is it's going to check that proof, and then it's going to grab um, the public inputs to that proof, so, so the public information, and it's going to interpret that according to a defined like the the Aztec three contract ABI. Uh, and so, what does that mean? It means that it's going to like basically grab certain public inputs, and it's going to say, okay, I'm going to interpret these as you know instructions to modify state variables. I'm going to interpret some other variables, some some other things as instructions to dest destroy state variables. And some of those public inputs can also instruct the kernel circuit to push more function calls onto the function call stack. Um, and then you have, and then you basically have an output function call stack. Uh, and so the idea is constructing a proof of the kernel circuit proves the correct, like executes a single function call. And so from that, how do you get composability? Uh, well, you, you, you get it through recursion. The idea is that something, a big detail that I've left out is that the kernel circuit, as part of its logic, if, um, if, if you're not calling it, basically, if you've, um, uh, the kernel circuit verifies a proof of itself at a previous iteration uh, in your transaction. So the idea is, you know, at, at step zero, you construct your kernel proof inside that circuit. It's not going to verify a previous iteration because there isn't one. But then once you get to step one and, and higher, it's going to say, okay, I, I need give me the, the, the kernel proof at the previous step. Uh, and so the idea is that it then does a consistency check. So if you think about the circuit as a program, you have your input function call stack, your output function call stack. And as you're iterating, um, it checks, this does a consistency check to check that the input call stack at, your, at the current step is equal to the output call stack at the previous step. And so you're going to keep doing this, this um, recursive construction uh, and, and grind your way through the, the function call stack until the call stack is empty. And at that point, what do you have? You have one proof of this kernel circuit. And on that kernel circuit's public inputs is going to be a list of the private state changes that you want, want to do. So basically, all of the encrypted um, like data that you want to add and, and also the, 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 the encrypted data you want to delete. Uh, in addition to that, um, there's going to be a uh, public function call stack. So the idea is that uh, your private functions can call public functions, um, but not vice versa, because they're going to be executed um, in, in different times. Uh, and so what happens is like a complete transaction is a kernel circuit proof with a list of state changes that are private, that are encrypted, and a list of public functions to execute. And that transaction gets then sent into a mempool, picked up by a sequencer, uh, and then gets integrated into a roll-up uh, block. That's impressive. Yeah, there's definitely voodoo cryptography happening there, and also the the separate call stacks. I think is fascinating as well. That mm. is that is really interesting. 
So then at the high level then in, in Noir, like I'm assuming it's easy to just specify that this this function should be private then? Is this just something the way that yeah. I define the function? Yes. Yeah, so so um it's currently like that's it's, that's a, like an in development branch of Noir. Like the release version of Noir doesn't have this contract syntax because it's just a it's a more basic language where you know you just have um like all, all your functions are private, uh, basically. Uh, but in the in the the, the contrast syntax we have, yes, basically you can declare your functions to be uh, public or private. Um, and so so like you don't need to know anything about these fancy kernel circuits or any any of that fluff to build NOR contracts. You just use a very simple heuristics. They are your functions can be public or they can be private, um, which changes the state variables that they can modify. And pri- public functions can't call private functions, but private functions can call public functions. But they're unilateral, as in, if I'm calling a public function, I can't have any return parameters. And that's because literally it's going to be executed at a different time. Uh, so as a transaction center, I execute my private functions, construct the proof, and then I kick it off to a sequencer. Um, and just like in a ZKVM, that sequencer is going to then construct the proofs of the public functions. So because, of, because there's that um, time lag, uh, you, can't, you can't then reference back into your private functions. But um, yeah, as a simple heuristic, basically, your, your public functions can't have return parameters and job done. Makes sense. And then on the sequencer itself, is there anything like particularly unique about the sequencer in comparison to some of the other ones that exist in the ZK world? Like, Well, we're planning on having making the sequencer selection protocol uh, hidden. Uh, so as in, you don't like, as in the sequencer's identity is private for a given block. Um, so the the idea is it's like a it's like a regular like tick eth eth um, eth two's sequence selection protocol. Um, sequences basically um, well validate for eth two. Um, you know ahead of time for a given block who your validator is going to be, and it's it's similar it's a similar thing for Aztec except that uh, they're using like a a pseudonym uh, so that, so that the public key that def- that describes who they are is to throw away single use um, uh, uh, identity, and then we we use like zkSnark. To, to to like to link that to a, to a to a real identity, but that's that link is hidden from to observers. Interesting. And then one thing I was just thinking through, like, and this just might be the completely wrong way to, to look at this, but does the decentralization of the sequencer itself matter less when so much privacy is baked into each individual like transaction itself? I would think that censorship would actually be more difficult because there's there's a lot of information that's hidden. Yeah. So so basically, the the issue is that. Um, to build any kind of useful, meaningful ZK DAP, um, you're going to need a hybrid application with both public and private information. Think about, for example, just take, take, an, take an AMM. Uh, for an AMM to work, you need liquidity pools, um, and you need to know the value in those liquidity pools. That's public information. That's public state, uh, which you can't represent privately because, well, everyone needs to know what it is. Uh, and so you have this kind of this, this problem of DeFi. And how do you make DeFi private when you when you have to have these public trust like trustless algorithms that are kind of um, operating autonomously? And the solution is a bit of a bit of a sneaky one, which is basically you kind of don't. Um, what you do instead is you make the identities of the people interacting with the DeFi protocol private. Uh, so you kind of you, you get you get privacy for the user, but you get transparency for the protocol, which in my opinion is kind of the best of all worlds because you don't really want uh, like to interact with a protocol where you, where the the actual algorithms being run are kind of inscrutable because then how do you know it's um, acting honestly? Uh, but that kind that kind of privacy preserving hybrid application still has problems with MIF. Basically, once your once your once your application is calling public functions, you've got issues with with MIF extraction. Therefore, you can have censorship attacks. You can have reordering attacks. So I don't want to over overplay how resistant. Um, our network is to that. Certainly, if you're just doing purely privacy preserving transactions, um, then yes, you basically can't be censored because the sequencer doesn't have any information to censor you with. Or they they just see some some chip that like literally that your transaction will be um well if, if our security procedures are correct, your transaction will be indistinguishable from random noise. So there'll be nothing, no information to censor you with. Um, but uh, things get a bit more complicated once you introduce public state and hybrid applications. I'm with you. I think that makes sense. Um, I mean, so in this system, we are introducing like it, it is. It is a little bit more complex to understand the entire mental model all the way down, like like under the hood, mm-hmm. right? This is more complicated than like the Huff guys understanding the EVM. Ideally, this continues to get easier and easier to build with. It's already light years ahead of where it was when you first started. Thanks a lot of the work you guys have done with Noir. Um, 
but what kinds like, like how do you expect people to like write the first programs on top of Aztec and ensure also like like a similar level of security to what they have when they write an EVM contract, right? This is a, a new language. Uh, there's more complexity. Are there any new things when it comes to smart contract security that you think people should definitely be aware of when they're writing programs in Noir? That's a very interesting question. So obviously, because there's a new language, there's going to be new security practices, new paradigms, and they're going to have to be figured out one by one. I mean, we have we have a lot of prior knowledge based off of Solidity, based off of the, the, the history of attacks. And so um, even though the language is different, I think it still it still helps um, like the overall like awareness of the kind of attacks you can what you can do in a distributed environment helps with making sure that you know um, the initial initial applications are secure. Uh, when it comes to new things you can do, um, certainly the thing that we are mostly concerned about is um, things like cryptography bugs, basically where people who introduce vulnerabilities into their applications because they're not using like cryptographic primitives correctly. And we want to try and avoid that as much as possible by like abstracting away that low level nitty gritty. Um, and so one of the issues, one of the issues that a lot of ZK um, applications have is a problem with under constrained uh, circuits. And by that, I mean that actually like the, the, the rules that you think your circuits are applying aren't quite what they really are applying. There's, there's, there's more wiggle room you can, and, and, that, and you can maybe use that to create double spending attacks, that kind of thing. Um, but that's kind of our job to solve as in, uh, we've kind of not, we've not really, I don't think we've really executed very well on our, on our goals. If it's, if it's, if, if, if users are able to kind of like grab foot guns that allow them to easily create these under constraint functions. Um, so, but I think, I think a lot of it is going to be, uh, um, just, uh, I mean, when you like, we're, we're creating a very new, kind of a very new paradigm in terms of, you know, Previously, preserving applications where you have encrypted states, where you have this, like, but, but in a in a composable, um, but you still have smart contracts that are composable. And I do feel like this is going to be a lot. But like, what we really need is is feedback from the community and people building all this um, this stuff. Uh, ideally, before we hit mainnet, um, like we're we're planning on getting a local developer to set out uh, in in three months. Um, we're going to be going to test it by the end of the year, hopefully. Uh, and then we've got Noir, which is um, like it's. Uh, its own standalone language that you don't need the ASIC free network to work in. And like just the more people we have hacking around with it, the more feedback we get, um, the, e- the, the easier it, um, it's going to be to make it secure. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't think I have any easy, simple solutions. You know, it's, 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 there's always a challenge building something for the first time. Yep. Yeah, I don't think there are any. Um, and that's actually a good segue into what I was going to ask you next. Um, like what what are you excited about in the Noir roadmap? And like, like, what are some of the things you, you'd like to see people build as well? What are things i like to see people build? I guess, I guess when it comes to that question, I kind of, I have, to, I, wear, I wear two hats. Um, uh, one of them is the, is the CEO hat of like, what's useful to build? You know, I'd like, to, what would be nice? It'd be nice to have libraries, like big integer arithmetic. It'd be nice to have cryptographic primitives. Nice to have digital signature um, schemes uh, that in the Noir standard library. Uh, that kind of useful stuff would be really cool. Um, then there's kind of just the, the more like the, the more like nerd hacker um, hat, which is like I'm like just what's fun to build. That would be that would be awesome. And so uh, things like um, what I would really like um, with Noir is to is for some some somebody to create a proof of doom. Uh, so okay, so basically, um, I think you could probably just about. Either either now or in a in a in a in a, in a, in a imminent release of Noir, it might be it's probably just about fast enough that you can emulate a six five zero two CPU in Noir. So, uh, six five zero two uh, for for the for for folks who are a little younger than me is a is one of the earliest computer chip, microcomputer chips that kicked off the microcomputer revolution. So super primitive. Uh, it's got like three thousand transistors in it, uh, but it was used to power things like the NES, uh, the original Nintendo console. It was used to power this weird ancient computer called the Commodore sixty four. Uh, and the Commodore 64 is the most primitive computer that exists that has a port of Doom for it. <laughs> so if you can emulate that chip, you can emulate the Commodore 64. If you can emulate the Commodore 64, you can then emu- you can then emulate uh, like a proof of Doom and put it on chain. And then we can finally get to the point where Ethereum can run Doom. Uh, that's what I would like to see. I love that. Well, I have a I have a, like a burgeoning theory on this that a lot of the innovation just is 
coming from the tinkering anyway, right? Like, and and even mm-hmm. like indirectly, right? So like, for example, the 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 Huff guys we, we were talking about earlier, all of them have fantastic jobs at good places right now. And they learned incredibly quickly because they just did what was fun, right? So build proof of doom, right? Maybe it doesn't, maybe no one uses it. I don't know. But you might end up becoming an expert on noir and and then building all the useful stuff and and who knows. But uh... yeah, absolutely. I think while we're still in this kind of development phase, very much the goal is just to give people a playground to experiment with. Is in having private state in a smart contract it explodes the design space of what you can do in a way that's really not been explored at all. Um, in, like, way in, and, you know, I'm not, I can't fully predict uh, what people will end up building with Aztec 3 in, um, uh, like in, 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 the, in, like in, in, in several years when it's, you know, when it's launched, when it's stable, when it's mature. I mean, there's going to be obvious, the obvious low hanging fruit. There's going to be a bunch of ZK games, which are awesome. There's going to be identity solutions, which are very, very useful. There's going to be people bringing on like, like, creating this kind of like this bridge between TradFi and DeFi. Um, you're also just going to have much more like strong, stronger privacy guarantees and signed DeFi protocols. You're going to have things like privacy preserving DAOs, private voting. Uh, um, but I, I suspect there's a lot that I'm, that I'm not seeing just because um, there's just, there's just, uh, there's just not, not been a huge amount of um, just brain power really exploring the design space for what you can do once you have privacy on a, on a transparent ledger. And we just want to give people the tools to play around and explore. I love it. Well, you guys are doing good work. Um, Thank you. For people that are early in their career, I mean, let's say early to, to mid-level devs, maybe like where you were like, you know, between like 2016, and 2018. I mean, I guess by, by 2018, you were probably far down the rabbit hole. But for that kind of cohort of people, do you have any general advice for them on building their career in the space, building interesting things? Anything you wish you would have known then? Uh, I think they'd, they'd appreciate any any insight you have. I think um, so. I'm just starting to think back to my original, like when I was in my original, like back in my shoes. Um, what advice would I give to myself? I think one of the advice was basically being like, "Chill the fuck out." <laughs> and then there's so much FOMO in this space, right? You know where. I, there's, I think there's a constant fear, right? That if you're that uh, you're not like if you're spending your time on one thing, like um, like a particular like a DeFi project or a language or some tooling, then you're missing out by not spending your time on other things. You know, like oh, you like right, uh, you know, there'll be people pulling in all sorts of directions. You should learn ZK, you should learn machine learning, you should go into DeFi, you should go into NFTs, you should do blah 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 blah. Um, but generally, it's like everybody I've known, I've met in this space. That's like that's really. Um, like successful, uh, like in, or not just successful in terms of commercial, but enjoying their lives. You know, like, like uh, they're the ones who 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 experiment basically, who who follow follow their own interests uh, and see where that leads them. So if you think something's cool or interesting, work on it. You know, um, and see where see where it goes. A lot of this, a lot of a lot of this community is about skills are extremely important, but networks are also important. As in by collaborating on open source projects, building open source tech, you'll meet other people. You'll be co- co- collaborating with other people. You'll, you'll become like, and you'll you'll just get to know more people in the space. And the more people you know, the more ideas that you're that, that you're going to be exposed to, and the more potential collisions there are with things that you're interested in. And you know, eventually one day you'll probably you'll know you'll see something on Telegram or Slack or whatever or, or uh, Twitter or Discord, and you'll think, hmm, that's interesting, uh, and it'll change your life. <laughs> like like for example. Uh, I get, I, if I get, think back to like the, what is the most, what is the conversation I had that changed my life um, in the most dramatic way possible? And I know exactly what it is. It was um, late December, 2016. I was chatting, chatting with my brother and my brother was like, oh, by the way, Zach, yeah, I've got this friend, Tom. Uh, he's uh, thinking about doing a, a, a blockchain setup um, and he's looking for someone, to, a technical co founder uh, Like, you want to talk to him? And I was like, Oof. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Sure. Why not? <laughs> that was it, um, and that changed my life. So, yeah, it's it's just about um, just exposing yourself to to things you're interested in. I love it. I love it. Yeah, great message in there, and I think that uh, the people that I know that have been really successful have have followed a similar path. So I think you're spot on there. Um, 
can I rewind back? I, I feel like I need to give you the corporate answer. Um, if you want to maximize success in your career, you should learn noir. <laughs> And you should program it <laughs> Well, I was going to ask you uh, what the uh, what any final calls to action you had were before we wrap up, but it sounds like those are two of them. Is there anything else you want you want to leave people with? Um, I think leave people just like uh, if you search for Noir Lang um, or Noir GitHub, you'll find out you'll find our repos. Um, all our getting started stuff. Um, yeah, please feel free to tinker around, ex- explore, give us feedback. Um, but yeah, other than that, any, any calls to action? Um, yeah, basically just like follow, follow us, uh, follow us on Twitter, follow Aztec, follow me, uh, if, if, yeah, if, if folks are interested. Um, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, you know, if, if you, if you're curious about any of the stuff that we've been talking about, check out Huff, check out Noir, check out, check out Aztec, check out just General ZK. It's a, it's a pretty awesome place to be. Awesome. We'll link to all that in the show notes. But Zach, thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Sam. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. 